Good evening, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome, and thank you so much to Aware for actually asking me here tonight to talk about sleep. Um, so hopefully, by the end of this lecture, you're going to take away a couple of things. First of all, just how important our sleep is to our general physical health and also our mental health. Um, and then also, if any of you do suffer from any problems with sleep, hopefully you'll have a few tips in there that'll help to get you sleeping a little bit better. Um, so basically, what we first of all, we'll start off is, what is sleep? First of all, sleep is something we spend one third of our lives doing, but it's something we tend to not think about too much at all, if at all. Um, and usually when we do think about sleep, it's because we have a problem with our sleep, and then usually we think about it too much. But actually, sleep is actually a very, very organised process. And there's a very kind of strict structure of sleep that, that should be there in order for us to feel the way we should do the next day. And the way we look at sleep in the lab is basically by looking at people's brain activities. So we'd be putting a whole load of electrodes onto the brain activity. Um, and what we would, all of you now here are awake and are alert, so your brain activity will be really, really fast frequency. But as you start to feel drowsy, that will all start to slow down. And how that activity actually looks um, is going to really tell us what stage of sleep you're in. And if you look here, there are different stages of sleep that we go through during the night. So we have wakefulness, stage one, stage two, and then there's stage three and stage four. That's all put together now as one in, in new guidelines. And then we have this rapid eye movement. So, as I said, once you start to feel drowsy, brain activity starts to slow down a little bit. And usually, it takes about 20 minutes, and we've gone into this very, very light stage of sleep, what we call N1. This is where you kind of get that sensation of falling. You might get these little jerks. And any little thing, you're nearly aware of what's going on around you, so any little noise, etc., will bring you back to wakefulness. And you can have these little micro-sleeps as well. But this is a really, really poor quality sleep. We'd only need about 5% of our total night's sleep to be made up of this because it's pretty useless. Then, pretty quickly, we go into what we call stage 2 sleep. Brain activity slows down again, and then there are different characteristics for us to look at as we, as we analyse the sleep. But about half of our night's sleep would be made up of this stage 2 sleep. But again, that's not the good stuff. The good stuff comes about an hour after we've initially fallen asleep, and that's where our brain activity is at its slowest. It's we're into a really, really deep stage of sleep. This is the really restorative stuff. Um, cells regenerate, muscles recuperate, and growth hormone, etc., is produced in this stage of sleep. So as adults, we'd need about 20% for a night's sleep to be made up of that. Children, teenagers would need an awful lot more because of this production of growth hormone. So then, that's about an hour after we've fallen asleep. Then about an hour and a half after we've initially fallen asleep, whole brain activity is going to speed up again. It's going to look pretty much like you're awake, but there's going to be a couple of different changes. Our breathing is going to become a little bit more irregular. Our heart rate can become a bit more erratic. And our muscles are going to become completely paralysed. And we're going to have these rapid eye movements. We've gone into dream sleep, okay? That's a whole cycle of sleep done and dusted with. So each cycle of sleep lasts about two hours. And then what happens is the whole thing starts again. And we have a couple of cycles, three to four, maybe even five cycles of sleep a night. But if you notice, we get this good deep sleep within the first third of the night. And then the dreams get longer as the night progresses. We're also a little bit more prone to brief awakenings. Um, etc. towards the end of the night. But these awakenings should be so brief that we're not really aware of it and it's not really a problem. So this is how basically our sleep period should look like. If it doesn't look like that, we're not going to feel the effects the next day. Okay? The other thing to remember is sleep is not something that just happens. There is a whole biological rhythm going on there in the background. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of a circadian rhythm. It's actually our body clock. Um, and what that basically means is that every living thing follows some kind of a cycle. And us as human beings, our cycle is just a little over 24 hours long. But we slot it into the 24-hour period because we are so dictated by the rotation of the sun, etc. But what this basically means is that within that 24-hour period, along each period of time, there are different physiological occurrences to happen. And to put it very basically, our bodies are like a machine. And to keep that machine in good running order, 
basically the same thing should be happening at the same time every day along that 24 hour cycle. When it comes to sleep, there are three main um, rhythms going on. And remember, it's a 24 hour cycle. And I talked to you throughout this lecture about daytime and nighttime. It's a 24 hour period. What we do during the day affects how we sleep at night, and how we sleep at night is going to affect how we uh, function during the day. So we always look at sleep. I don't ask me why, it's probably just easier for us in the lab to look at it when we're looking at information. We always look from 12 noon to the following 12 noon. First thing we're going to talk about is your core body temperature. Right about now, we have the, the highest core body temperature w that we'll experience. But in the next hour or so, it should start to dip. And we'll reach our absolute minimum about 3, 4, between 4 maybe and 6 o'clock in the morning. But in order to feel sleepy, we need that core body temperature to fall. Okay? The next thing is this thing called a sleep propensity. Okay? What this means is that during our wakeful periods, we are constantly building up this sleep need or sleep debt. And like every other debt, it's going to have to be paid back, unfortunately. So again, right about now, none of us should really be feeling sleepy. Now, listen to me for the next half hour. That might change. But... <laughs> As the night progresses, that, that need for sleep is going to increase. The longer we're awake, the more we're going to need sleep. And then the third thing is this thing called melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone. It's produced naturally in our brains, and it's a natural sleep promoter. Um, melatonin can be bought on prescription. Um, if you go to the States, you can buy it over the counter. It's regarded as a food supplement. Um, in Europe, they've got really, really strict guidelines and there are very strict criteria for getting um, the prescription of melatonin, but it can be used a lot in jet lag, and that's why a lot of people would, would use that coming back from, from, from travel. So the thing about melatonin, you can see here, we don't produce any of it during the day because we only produce melatonin when it's completely dark. So as it gets dark, increase in melatonin. So, where you have this dip in core body temperature, an increase in the need for sleep, and an increase in the production of melatonin, for most people it's around 11 o'clock at night. Then where the opposite happens, it's usually around 7 o'clock in the morning. So this is where the whole 11 to 7 comes from. However, not everybody falls into that category. There can be instances of um, um, people where this, all of this happens naturally much further on during the night, about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, they're feeling sleepy. This is a thing called delayed sleep phase syndrome, and it's really, really common in teenagers, for example. For some reason, they have this shift in the body clock. Not too, we're still not too sure why, but we know it does happen. Um, but usually then, when they get into the working environment, everything kind of slots back into place. There is also a condition called advanced sleep phase syndrome, where all of this happens much earlier on during the day, maybe 3, 4 o'clock in the daytime. Um, that's really, really uncommon, um, very, very uncommon. I've only maybe seen it maybe once in the last 14 years or so. But if you notice, don't confuse this thing. If you're starting to feel sleepy post lunchtime, don't think, oh, she said I've delayed or advanced sleep phase syndrome. We have a little dip in, our, in this core um, or in the circadian rhythm. And that's where the whole siestas are the little naps. But we tend, if we do have a nap, it really is only a nap because we have, okay, the dip in core body temperature. We have an increase in the need for sleep. But the one thing that's missing is we don't have the production of melatonin. So if we do nap during that time, it's only for half an hour or so. Um, so the other thing to remember is this whole rhythm can be... Um, changed or altered by the environment, the things that's going on around us, so work schedules, meal times, this can all be changed. And a lot of some of the, I'll talk mostly for this lecture about insomnia, or what we can also, we, a lot of us might be able to relate to jet lag, this whole system is just out of sync, and that's what we'll be talking about. But again, this needs to keep in a really, really good kind of work like clockwork. And again, it's the 24 hour cycle, but again, it's seven days a week as well, and I'll talk about the seven days a week later on. So the next question, probably the most common question I get asked, is how much sleep do I need? Okay. This is kind of the latest guidelines, um, recommendations, but what I'd like you to get from this slide is that our need for sleep decreases as we progress through life. 
So this is kind of a, a, a slideshow on what may be appropriate, what's recommended, and then what's not recommended. So you can see a newborn baby anywhere there between 11 and 19 hours may be appropriate with this 14 to 17 hours being recommended. We know that getting less than this is not good and equally getting too much sleep is not good either. We tend to know more about this than getting less than getting too much. But most adults around here, we need anywhere between 6 and 10 with the 7 to 9 being the recommended. And slap bag in the middle of that is our eight hours, which we're all obsessed with getting. And I have to say, very few of us are actually getting eight hours sleep. Um, on average now, we're only getting about six and a half hours. We're all getting much less sleep than we did, say, 50 years ago. But we're all running around panicking and, you know, getting very anxious about we're not getting our eight hours. As I said, we're all obsessed with this eight hours. But I want us to really forget about hours. It's all about the quality of sleep that you're getting. You could be getting your 10 hours sleep, but if it's not in that pattern of sleep that I've just showed you at the beginning, again, you're not going to feel the effects of it. It's all about good quality, good consolidated sleep. Um, and a lot of patients I would see in the insomnia clinic, the one thing they can't get their head around is that post-treatment, they tend to be getting a little bit less sleep than uh, post-treatment than they did before the treatment but they feel so much better and that's the one thing they can't still get their head around about but it's all about the quality of sleep that we actually get so try not to focus too much on, on numbers it's how you feel the next day so what happens if we don't get this normal sleep um, and I think we're all becoming more and more aware of the effects of poor sleep and how it's going to affect us so we can all associate what it's like to have the effect of one poor night's sleep Okay, so there, we have the short-term effects of not getting good sleep. Um, so usually the, the most common effect is feeling sleepy the next day. You'll have yawning. Um, your memory might not be just as sharp. Your concentrations might be not just as sharp as they should be. And you might be a little bit irritable. We can all associate with the little child that, that's overtired. They get cranky. Adults are exactly the same. We get cranky if we don't get a good night's sleep. So that's the short-term effects. But the long-term problems are, are, are the ones we need to really kind of zone in on. And all the studies have shown that if we go and have consistently poor quality sleep, it does lead to things like obesity, um, risk of diabetes, um, an impaired <coughs> immune system, cardiovascular disease. All of this has been linked to poor quality sleep as well. And it, I can talk about some of the the different disorders that, that we do see. Um, we also see now with children as well, their, their um, growth suppression as well can, can be a problem as well if they have problems with sleep. So sleep is now regarded as the third pillar of health, along the other two being diet and exercise. We all know about the, how important it is to have a good diet. We all know how important it is to have good exercise and regular exercise. But nobody tells us about sleep. And it's just as important as the other two. Um, so it's absolutely vital. We can't live without sleep, basically. Some scary facts, just kind of like to throw them in. Um, so these are kind of really kind of um, accidents or, um, that have happened that um, would have been well known in the media and have all been related back to sleep. Majority of the time, people on shift work. Um, in, back in 79, the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island, the one we all know about was the Chernobyl um, meltdown, um, Space Shuttle Challenger explosion, American Airlines flight in 99. Um, obviously now there's a recognition in, in the, the medical end of things for the um, lack of sleep and medical errors, but um, medical doctors, nurses, they're still doing crazy hours. So um, the, and the, all the studies that have been really done, a lot of them have come out of the States. Um, and they did a study and uh, it was showed that insomniacs had doubled the rate of absenteeism as people that didn't have sleep disorders. Um, the new buzzword in, word in HR is presenteeism. Okay, you might be at work, but you're really not. You're there physically, but mentally you're not. And I would see a lot more companies asking me to come in to talk to them to try to get the most out of their staff because sleep is a huge, huge problem and sleep deprivation. Um, I suppose when it comes to, to, to money, money talks, as they say, and in 90, way back as far as 1990, 
Again, another American study, it showed that insomnia, and this is just insomnia, which is just one sleep disorder, cost the US economy 15.4 billion a year. And I said, that's in 1990, and that was insomnia. And I'd say our insomnia, risk prob- our, our insomnia rates have probably gone up since that as well. So, I mean, this is a huge financial burden as well. Um, you might be sitting here saying, well, look, it, I'm not going in to work in a nuclear plant, or I'm not going to be flying airplanes. It's not really going to be a life or death situation if I go into my desk and I'm not really as, as sharp as I should be. But the one thing that we do every single day is we drive. And sleepy driving is a huge risk. The RSA have, gone, have, have done a lot of media um, initiatives around this in the last couple of years. They've had ads on TV as, as well. Um, so sleepy driving is so, so dangerous. Um, really, if you're sleepy, you shouldn't be driving in the first place. Um, but again, these are studies from the, the Road Safety Authority. It shows that um, one in five driver deaths um, in Ireland may be due to driver fatigue. And also, with these accidents, they can be three times more likely to result in death or serious injury. That's because when you're sleepy, you don't have reaction times. Um, and then it was highlighted in the media um, last summer, um, there was a, a 64-year-old man, who was, he was jailed um, because he was actually, he fell asleep at the wheel, you might remember it, and he ran into a young mother who was out wheeling her baby. So, I mean... Even the, uh, the European laws for driving have really taken sleepiness on board. They have now very strict guidelines. If you are sleepy and you present to your GP, they won't sign you off for, for your licence. Um, your insurance companies, they won't cover you if you have a, sleep, a known sleep disorder that's not treated. So the whole thing about sleepiness and driving is really starting to, 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 to really pull its weight. So, okay, so why are we sleepy? Okay, Um, there are actually over 80 sleep disorders in total. um, And they're categorised into different different, um, subcategories. We have intrinsic sleep disorders, insomnia, which is the most common sleep disorder of them all. There is a thing called obstructive sleep apnea. Um, This is a respiratory sleep disorder. So during your sleep, um, your airway collapses in on itself. Um, And you either stop breathing or you have a reduction in your breathing effort. Along with that, you have drops in oxygen levels, sends the signal to the brain. Brain's way of rectifying all of that is basically trying to wake you up. You're not aware that you're being woken up, but you're being dragged from a deep sleep back to a very, very light sleep. So the whole sleep would be very fragmented. The quality of sleep wouldn't be good either. So that can lead to extreme sleepiness during the day um, and also can lead to to cardiovascular disease disease if it goes untreated. Um, Some of the most common symptoms, snoring, but it's not just the snoring, it's the pauses in the breathing that goes along with that. Getting up to go to the toilet during the night, waking up with a dry mouth um, and feeling sleepy the next day. Um, The other um, intrinsic sleep disorder is narcolepsy. Again, this has had a lot of um, media attention in the last couple of years due to the post-swine flu vaccination. Um, a lot of young children, young mothers, healthcare workers did develop narcolepsy, which is a neurological sleep disorder, um, and that was post-swine um, flu vaccination. It's a lifelong condition. Again, we tend to be very sleepy during the day. They have very fragmented sleep. They can have abnormal behaviours in their sleep. Um, and they can also have a thing called cataplexy, where they basically lose their muscle tone. And I said it can be a lifelong, it is a lifelong condition. And then we also have a thing called hypersomnia. That's just basically the opposite to insomnia. Insomnia is not being able to sleep, um, and I'll talk about that just in a bit. Um, but hypersomnia is sleeping too much. Okay. Okay, then we have the extrinsic sleep disorders. This is inadequate sleep syndrome, which a lot of us can be suffering from. Alcohol or stimulant dependent, because that can really change our, the whole structure of our sleep and have a huge impact on, on the quality of sleep. And then we have these circadian rhythm sleep disorders. Again, going back to that whole body clock, that's when it's basically out of sync. So things again like the, the jet lag, so, which we can experience. Um, shift work disorder. Um, and the delayed and advanced sleep syndrome, which I've already spoken about. So that whole rhythm is just out of sync. 
And then we have the parasomnias. These are my favourite. Um, these are all the abnormal things that people get up to while they sleep. So things like sleepwalking. We have the nightmares. We have REM sleep behaviour disorder. Um, and believe me, things, people can get up to very, very strange things while they sleep. Nothing shocks me anymore. And then we have then the disorders that are associated with medical um, or psychiatric associations. So we have panic disorder, anxiety, dementia, with nocturnal epilepsy, Parkinson's, um, and things like COPD and asthma, etc. So, as I said, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to concentrate on insomnia because that's what I kind of specialise in. Um, there are lots of statistics out there, um, none coming from Ireland, but we think it's usually, most um, studies are showing that 10 to 15% of the population suffer from insomnia, which is a huge percentage of people. Um, in people suffering from depression, that jumps up to over 80% of people with depression also suffer from insomnia. So it's a huge, huge amount. Um, and from speaking to people that have suffered from depression, a lot of them have said, you know what? I didn't even know really I was depressed. I just knew that I had a problem with my sleep. And that, that's the first thing that can present. Um, again, there are different classifications um, to, um, to, 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 to categorise insomnia. Um, we go by the DSM-5. Um, and there are different criteria. Um, we, we look at the nighttime symptoms. So problems getting off to sleep initially. Some people get off to sleep, but they can't stay asleep. Then we have what we call getting restless sleep, or you can have early morning awakenings. And this is all despite adequate opportunities for getting, for, to get that sleep. Then what we look at then is the daytime symptoms. Remember, it's a 24-hour cycle, so how the night goes is going to affect. And also, just going back on this, I said, um, um, just to go back to this criteria here, sometimes you can might just have one of them, you might have a bit of everything, or they can also change. It might start off that you have a problem getting to sleep, but six months down the line, you might get off to sleep, but then you find you can't stay asleep. So this, as I said, it can be a mixture, it can be one, or it can change. That also needs to be happening at least three nights out of seven. Then you have the knock-on effect, the daytime consequences. Obviously, the first effect, feeling sleepy, poor concentration levels, um, short-term memory, not great, not quite as good as it should be. Um, mood disturbances, I mentioned the irritability. Reduced motivation, okay? reduced e um, energy. And again, more prone to the, the um, errors, accidents at work, and again, the driving. Um, you can also have headaches, and you can also have tummy upsets. And along with this, with insomnia, once you have all of these in place, then what usually comes is a concern or a worry about sleep. And this is where the whole obsession with sleep starts to, and the negative association with sleep starts to develop. So again, insomnia has changed quite a lot in the last just couple of years. The DSM-5 came out in 2013, and it brought in a whole um, groups of, of patients that wouldn't necessarily have met the criteria previously. Um, previously, we, they always kind of looked for a cause for the insomnia. They were someone who came in suffering from insomnia with their sleep. They always tend to say, right, is there something going on? Is there another disorder there? For example, I see a lot of people with fibromyalgia. Previously, they said, right, okay, we'll target the fibromyalgia and sure the sleep will sort itself out. That whole way now is gone. That whole way of thinking is completely gone. And what this DSM-5 has brought in it has brought in, uh, insomnia is now recognised as a disorder in its own right, okay? So it must be treated independently of any other disorder that's there. And that, as I said, has brought in a huge group of people that wouldn't have necessarily been, been, been thought of as an insomniac. Um, the other thing change that it's brought in is it's now looked at a sleep-wake disorder. It's not just the nighttime problems, it's looking at the knock-on effect that it's having the next day. And again, bringing back that 24-hour cycle. So, what is insomnia? Um, insomnia, there are kind of three different parts to the whole insomnia puzzle. For, and this is what we call the three Ps. So it's the model for chronic insomnia. Because remember, there's short-term insomnia, which is usually lasts a couple of weeks. 
Um, and then you have long-term chronic insomnia, which usually lasts three months or more. Um, so first of all, you may be the type of person that might be a little bit more vulnerable to insomnia. Okay? Um, for example, women are twice as likely to have insomnia as men. Um, if you have somebody else in your family, um, you may be at a higher risk of insomnia. Um, if your um, social factors, for example, if you do shift work, I would see a huge portion of people in their later, later years, 50s, 60s, even into their 70s, they might have done shift work 30 years before. They'd be fine while they're doing the shift work, but it nearly always catches up with you at the end because our bodies are just not built to do shift work. And particularly when it's constantly rotating, um, that body clock has been constantly dragged out of sync and, and the body just gets completely confused. Um, also, people that have recently retired the body clock can start to drift a little bit because they don't have that alarm clock to get up to every morning. And then also people that are unemployment um, and suffering from in unemployment. Again, when you don't have a really kind of strict schedule in place, the body clock tends to run a little bit. Um, so the other thing then is the most common trait really of the insomniac is you might be a bit of an overthinker, a bit of a worrier. They're kind of the typical trait of the insomniac. Um, all of those doesn't mean you're definitely going to get insomnia because the next part of it is there has to be some kind of a precipitating factor. There has to be some kind of a stressor or a trigger, something that starts about sleepless nights. And this can be really anything, to be honest. Um, a lot of the time we look and say, look, something really bad must have happened, you know, obviously illness that can, can start about um, a psychiatric illness or a stressful life event. But I've seen people in the clinic where it's actually something good that has happened. Um, it could be anything. It could be I had one guy who he was an apprentice carpenter. He went home, he realised he'd cut out the wrong piece of wood. He started to panic, couldn't sleep that night. The next night he didn't sleep, the next night he didn't sleep, and that's where it all started. Um, I had one lady who had just celebrated her 50th birthday party. She said it was the best night of her life. She went to bed that night, she was so excited she couldn't sleep. She thought the next night, okay, I'm definitely going to sleep tonight. Sleep didn't happen. And then the panic set in and the worry set in and that's where it all stemmed from. So it really can be anything. The next thing then though is what keeps the insomnia going is that stressor or trigger might no longer be there. So we say, well, why hasn't the sleep gone back to normal pattern? Because what happens then is when you fall into a bad pattern of sleep, you start to develop these bad habits to cope with the fact that you're not sleeping well. So you might be taking naps during the day. You might be trying to go catch up for, uh, uh, for sleep at the weekends. You might be drinking too much coffee to keep yourself awake. So what happens then is, it's like everything else. If you constantly do something over and over and over <coughs> again, it becomes the normal. So this poor passion of sleep has now become the person's normal passion of sleep. And that's what we call psychophysiological insomnia. It's basically a learned behaviour kept going by bad habits. So... Again, common causes. I've gone through these. I skip on from that. Um, just a little bit about um, sleep disturbances in psychiatric disorders. Um, obviously, the depressive disorders, bipolar, generalized disorders, panic disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, and schizophrenia. And again, when we talk about these disorders, it's always, nearly always, the insomnia. Okay. Um, and again, as I mentioned just earlier, over 80% of people. Um, suffer that, um, from insomnia and also depression. Um, hypersomnia that I mentioned was the oversleeping. You tend to see that a little bit more in the younger people that are suffering from depression. And then as they get older, then it's usually the insomnia. I have to say, to be honest, it says 40% they're hypersomnia. I see a lot of the younger people suffering from depression and they will be more so an insomnia issue than, than the hypersomnia issue. Um, the other thing to remember that insomnia is an independent risk factor for development of depression and it's also an increased risk for its reoccurrence. Um, so the insomnia can be a predictor that for someone that's already been diagnosed with depression can be a predictor that there may be another bout of depression down the line. The other thing that the studies have shown and, and it's now um, believed that there is actually a threefold increase in the risk of suicide in someone that suffers from depression 
and insomnia. So this will just show you that how important it is to get to target their sleep in someone, in someone that's suffering from depression as well. It's absolutely vital to get their sleep sorted as well. Um, this is just, again, this whole pattern of sleep we call sleep architecture. Again, this is the normal one, going back to the very first slide that I showed you. It's what I always say to patients, it's like changing gears in a car. It should go from a nice gear from one down to the next to the next. Nice flow. This is with somebody with insomnia. Now, even by looking at that, you're going to know there's something very different from this. First of all, it takes them nearly about an hour and a half to get off sleep initially. And then when they do, they get off sleep, go into a light stage of sleep, back awake again, another bit of sleep, back awake again. So it's constantly like this. So again, like driving the car, if you're constantly chopping and changing gears in the car, it's not going to be the best of drives. So you can see this whole quality of sleep is absolutely horrific. But the other thing to remember is that they are getting bits of sleep, okay? But the quality is not there and it's really, really fragmented. So again, the person the next morning is definitely not going to feel like they've slept well after that. They're going to feel pretty wrong. Um, depression, again, when we're analysing sleep, we can tell an awful lot by how this whole pattern of sleep, what, by how that looks like, we can tell a lot by, by the patient. Um, and we can even tell that somebody might be suffering from depression and they might not even know it themselves by looking at their sleep. Um, so again, there can be this whole, uh, uh, it's not consolidated, there can be a lot of, of fragmentation. Deep sleep, for example, is reduced in the depressed patient and remembers that deep sleep that we need to feel refreshed the next day. Usually it takes us about 90 minutes to go in to dream sleep. In the depressed patient, they will go into dream sleep a lot quicker than that. It can also happen in the sleep-deprived patient as well. Um, we will find that the duration of, of REM in the first period of the night, and usually it should be the shortest, in somebody with depression, it's actually the, it's prolonged as well. It's not as short as it should be. Um, they may have more dream sleep than normal. More, normally we'd have about 20%. They'll have an increase in that. And we also look at these rapid eye movements. For some reason, they have an increase in the number of these rapid eye movements for some reason. But said, not, not everybody, but it can happen. The other thing that I just quickly mentioned is a thing called cortisol. And again, this is, what, is it, um, in relation to insomnia. Um, cortisol is the stress hormone. And what it does is when we wake up in the morning, we usually have a, a surge of cortisol to kind of boost us into the day. And as the day progresses, those levels of cortisol should fall. And usually come evening time, the level, they're kind of at their lowest because it's to allow the body to, or for the body to kind of go into relaxation mode. Now, obviously, if there are any kind of stressful incidents or anything during the day, they'll spike, but they should come back down again. But with people with insomnia, it's shown that they have higher levels of cortisol prior to sleep. And with the higher levels of cortisol, it leads to this, what we call, hyperarousal activity in the brain. So as I said, the brain activity should be slowing down, but you can see little bits where it's actually speeding up because it can be associated with these higher levels of cortisol. So I'll talk about relaxation just before I finish up. So it's really, really important to be as relaxed as you possibly can before bedtime. And it's easier said than done, because I suppose when you're having a problem with sleep and you don't know how that night, whether it's going to be a good night or a bad night, or you're going to be tossing and turning, you're going to be stressed before going to bed. Um, so those levels of cortisol will probably be higher. So you need to kind of get them down and be as relaxed as possible. So treatments for insomnia. Um, as I said, there are lots, there are different treatments for all the different sleep disorders. I'm zoning in on just insomnia. Um, and there are basically two main treatments, and I suppose they go into short term and long term. Um, short term <clears throat> is the medication, the sleeping tablets that we're all familiar with. Um, and then the long term treatment is this cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia. Now, they use cognitive behavioural therapy in a lot of different disorders. This one that we use is purely geared towards insomnia. We're just targeting the insomnia. Um, I suppose medications, they have been the most commonly used down the years, and they still are. But really, we now know the long-term effects of people being on sleeping medication long-term. Um, 
but I suppose the G and GPs are the, usually the, the person that has most contact with insomnia because it's very seldom that the insomnia person actually gets into the sleep lab because there's not a lot we can do either. But medication has really been the only choice because there has been no other option because referrals to CBT programmes are pretty, pretty non-existent in this country, to be honest. Um, the UK, they're way ahead of us. It's run, out, it's run on the NHS. Here in Ireland, as I said, it's, it's pretty non-existent. Um, so we now know the long-term effects uh, or the effects of long-term medication and the sleeping medication. And... The, all the guidelines suggest that sleeping meds should really only be prescribed for two weeks at a time. I have seen people on sleeping medications for 30, 40 years. <clears throat> you will find that a lot of GPs now are getting a lot stricter on prescribing you the medication. You go to the GP, they will, you will tell them your problems, they say, okay, I'm going to prescribe you sleeping medication, but you're getting two weeks, that's it, you're not getting any more. But then again, I've seen people who've changed GPs because they know the next GP down the road will, will prescribe them. And also as well, a lot of us, when it comes to sleeping medication, we have no problems in taking your friend's medication or your mother's medication or your aunt's medication. And when you think about it, if somebody, you know, you'd never think of taking their heart medication, but you have absolutely no problem taking their sleeping medication. And really, you should not be doing it. Um, the, the effects of the medication, obviously the hangover effects, okay, the next day. You can feel really, really rotten after you take med uh, sleeping medication. I would see people, they might wake up 4 o'clock in the morning, can't sleep, they decide to take a sleeping tablet at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. Then they're getting up at 7 o'clock and they're driving their car. They might as well be taking a couple of pints and driving the car. Okay, so it really can affect your ability to drive. You have short um, memory loss. Older people are more at risk of falls if they're on sleeping medication. Um, it, obviously, when you start off on one dose, you start off on the lowest, but you'll find you have to keep up and up the dose to have the same effect. And you'll get to a stage where they basically just don't work anymore. But you stay on them because one of the major effects of coming off the medication is a rebound insomnia, which is usually worse than the, whatever started you off on the medication in the first place. So you're kind of stuck in that cycle. Um, so obviously long-term use can cause a dependence on it um, and then it can cause anxiety and ironically sleeplessness and depression. Okay? Um, you also need to be careful if you're on other medications because there can be interactions with the other medications that you're on as well. Also if there is any possibility of this <coughs> obstructive sleep apnea syndrome that can actually even make it even worse because it's a, if it's muscle relaxant, um, it can make the, the, the airway um, close in even more and make the sleep apnea even more severe. So technically they shouldn't be on, on sleeping medication if you suffer from sleep apnea. Um, so that's the short term. As I said, the long term treatment. Um, anyone that works in sleep disorders medicines, we have to follow very, very strict international guidelines. And our governing body is the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. So basically they tell us the rules, what we do, and how we, how we go about diagnosing disorders and how we go about treating them. Um, so cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia is the only recommendation for long-term treatment of insomnia. Um, and what this CBT does... It basically changes people's misconceptions about sleep or their misperceptions about sleep. The faulty beliefs about insomnia that they've begun to develop. Um, perceived daytime consequences. Um, and it's got an 80% 80, um, 80 success rate. And I suppose if you think about any form of treatment, an 80% success rate is a very, very high success rate. Um, so basically it's about teaching people, it's giving people the skills to basically to manage their insomnia. So what is involved in this, this um, program of, of cognitive behavioural therapy? Usually I would do, prior to people coming in to me, they'd have a GP referral letter um, and they'd usually have four treatment sessions. Um, the sleep won't be fixed after the four sessions, but we would hope to see some improvement. But the patient will be shown how to monitor their sleep as, as the time progresses. And one of the things we look at is a thing called sleep hygiene. And usually if you have a problem and you go to your GP, you say, I have a problem with my sleep. So they might give you your sleep and tablets and they'll probably give you a leaflet with this sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene alone is not enough 
for the treatment of chronic insomnia. It's really important, but it's not enough. What I say sleep hygiene is, it's kind of like good housekeeping for your sleep. It's the stuff we should all be doing. Um, and really it boils down to lifestyle and environmental factors. Okay. So what are the lifestyle factors that can affect sleep? Diet and meal times. Okay. What I'm not a dietitian, I'm not going to preach about you know how important a good a healthy diet is. Meal times, strict meal times, seven days a week. Something as simple as that can be very, very effective. It's the, these meal times, they're time givers. It's keeping that body clock in a really, really good working order. So if you have your breakfast at 8 o'clock every morning, the body starts to say, oh, it's 8 o'clock, it's breakfast time. If you have your lunch at 1 o'clock, so 1 o'clock, it's lunch time. You have your main meal then, say 6 o'clock, it knows it's 6 o'clock. And then following on from that, it knows it's time to sleep. So it's all about keeping a really good routine seven days a week. We're all great Monday to Friday because we have jobs and we have a routine to keep. But come then the weekend, all the routine goes out the window and that pushes the whole body clock out. Um, and that's what we call, we kind of start to develop what we call social jet lag. So it takes us a couple of days then to, to get back onto an even keel. Caffeine, I'm going to talk about that separately. And exercise. Exercise is really, really important, obviously for our general health and also our mental health. And the more energy we use up, the more we're going to need to replace that. And we replace that energy by sleep. The problem is, though, we're all starting to go to the gym on the way home from work. And I see gyms open at 9, 10 o'clock at night. We're all exercising way too close to bedtime or particularly come the summer. OK, you say, I'm having a problem with my sleep. I'll tire myself out, so I'll go for a big long walk at 10 o'clock at night because it's still bright or I'll go for a big long run. That body is then creating adrenaline, so it's too close to bedtime. So ideally, exercise should be done by maximum 7 o'clock in the evening. Now, obviously, if there are classes and stuff that need to be going on for later than that, I always allow that. But it's really, really important. Caffeine. OK? Caffeine is probably the most common drug we use to keep us alert. Um, and the way caffeine works is while we're awake, during our wakeful hours, we have this accumulation of a chemical called adenosine in our brain. So the longer we're awake, the more adenosine we're going to have. And what adenosine does is it gives us the sensation of feeling sleepy. However, what caffeine does is it blocks that action of the adenosine. So it acts as a stimulant. And the other thing about caffeine then is it's got quite a long um, half-life. It can take nine hours for caffeine to leave our system. So ideally, we should only have two cups of coffee a day, or caffeinated products a day, I should say, and no later than about three, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, we have a terrible habit in this country of having the cup of tea before bed. And as you go on to see, caffeine is actually in tea. It's actually in a lot of... It's hidden in a lot of things. Um, even decaf products has some caffeine in it. Hot chocolate is the kind of common thing that we'd have before going to bed. We think it'll make us feel sleepy. It'll actually do the opposite. There's caffeine in the coffee. A bar of chocolate before bed, there's caffeine in the chocolate. Some people might say to me, no, I don't drink caffeine. I only drink herbal teas. And I'd say, what kind of herbal teas do you drink? Oh, I drink the green tea. Again, caffeine in it. The shot of espresso, the can of Coke, the Red Bull. I mean, and more and more younger people are using these as mixers with alcohol as well, and they're, it's laced with caffeine. They're coming home at night and they're absolutely wired, but also a mix of a stimulant and with alcohol, which is a relaxant, not a good idea. Okay. Um, so we'd never really think about drinking a can of Coke before going to bed. But again, as I said, we're terrible in this country. We'll have a cup of tea before going to bed. Okay? Do not have a cup of tea. Or you can't sleep at night. You get up, you go down, and you make yourself a cup of tea. Don't. Don't do it. There's caffeine in it. It's going to keep you awake. And then, obviously, we have the brewed coffee and the instant coffee. And I do know people that have the cup of coffee instead of the tea before bed. My own dad does it the whole time. So please just be really, really um, careful with the caffeine intake. As I said, it's also hidden in a lot of products. If you take a headache tablet, if you look at the back of it, it'll have caffeine in it. If you have a cold or a flu and you take a remedy for that, there's probably caffeine in that as well. A lot of the fizzy drinks, not just the Coke, also have caffeine in it as well. Okay? 
So, environmental factors. <clears throat> so the environment in which we sleep is really going to determine how good or how bad we sleep. So the first thing we think about is noise. And this is unexpected noise or unexpected quietness because the body is actually very good at adapting to its surroundings. So if you live just right under Dublin airport, noise is probably not going to be an issue. But if you go for a weekend away and go to the middle of the country, you probably find it difficult to sleep because it's so quiet. Things as simple as earplugs can work wonders for people that are having problems with sleepless nights. Um, a lot of people who come and say to me, look, look, the bin lorries come round on a Tuesday morning at five o'clock and once I hear that bin lorry, I'm awake for the morning. Or uh, there's a pub down the road and every Friday and Saturday night, I'm awake the whole night. I was like, will you just get earplugs? Put them in. Don't wait for the noise to happen. If you know it's a Friday or Saturday night, you put them in before you go to bed. That's the problem. People say, yeah, I have earplugs and I wake up and I put them in. But at that stage, it's too late put them in beforehand and get earplugs that are actually comfortable. A lot of the cheaper ones, they're really uncomfortable. They don't fit your ears, they fall out and that's just going to disturb your sleep. So invest in a really good pair of earplugs, okay? Light, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about that separately because that's obviously the biggest determinant of when we sleep and when we wake. And then the other thing then is temperature, okay? So light. As I said, light is basically determines, our, light is our cue to be awake, Dark darkness is our cue to be asleep. Um, the problem is though, we're all, being, um, we're all being exposed to far too much artificial light, okay? Um, and the artificial light, the energy, the bulbs we all use now, they're all the energy efficient bulbs, great for the energy, but they're actually really bad for our sleep because the wavelength of light that they emit is what we call this blue light. And it's exactly the same type of light that all the smart devices emit, okay? Blue light and sleep are just, it, it's just terrible for our sleep. It cuts down on that production of melatonin. So that's why it's really, really important to have all the smart devices shut down at least two hours before you go to sleep. Um, the thing about the blue light, it actually has been proven to cut down on our production of melatonin. And remember, we need that boost of melatonin. Um, I would see, and particularly this time of year, the amount of teenagers I'm getting into the clinic because it's coming up to exam time, they're not sleeping. But I see them, they're in the bedroom, they're on the laptop, they're on the iPads all night long, and this is keeping that melatonin levels really reduced. It's also the, stimul um, the stimulation that goes along with it as well. You're keeping your mind really, really active by looking at all these smart devices and social media, etc. And it's, it's absolutely, it's, I see ch children now having their bedtime story being read on smart devices. It's so bad. The other thing about it is that the, the production of this melatonin, there has been studies done now that we know now that people that have reduced melatonin levels, for example, shift workers, and they've done studies with nurses that do shift work, they're at increased risk of breast cancer. And in males that do shift work with the reduced melatonin levels, they're at risk, increased risk of prostate cancer. So all of these smart devices, they're, they're just so bad for our sleep. The other thing then is in the living areas before sleep, we have to kind of prepare the body for sleep as well as prepare our mind for sleep. So ideally, about two hours before bed, we should start turning off the main lights if you have dimmer switches, start to bring the light levels down. If you don't have dimmer switches, turn off the main lights, turn on a lamp, okay? What you're trying to do is you're trying to recreate sunset. This is the body's cue to say, right, okay, lights are coming down. We need to start that whole process of, of the melatonin levels starting to increase. When it comes to the bedroom, bedroom needs to be pitch black dark. I can't express how dark the room has to be. It literally needs to be like a cave. It should be so dark that if you wake up and you need to get up to go to the toilet or anything, you can't see your way around the room. It has to be pitch black dark. You're trying to naturally um, produce those production or naturally get that production of melatonin going. Okay? So things like blackout blinds, particularly come the summer, um, five, four or five o'clock in the morning, it's bright. 
And again, that's your cue to be awake. And if you have any problems with insomnia, and particularly the early morning awakenings, um, and a lot of people with depression, it's the early morning awakenings that, that they suffer from, it's really important to keep those level, the, the, that light of level, um, or the light levels completely darkened. Um, things like you can get portable blackout blinds, because if you get them made specially, they can be quite expensive. You can go into Smith's Toy Store. They have um, portable blackout blinds for children's bedrooms that you just stick onto the, the windows. They're about 30, 35 euros. They'll last your lifetime. It'll be the best investment. They're called Grow Anywhere and definitely get them. Now, the other problem is some people can actually be afraid of the dark. And I have a lot of people that actually are. So obviously the blackout blinds are not going to be an option. There is a sleep mask that you can get instead. And that seems to work for people that are scared of the dark. And believe me, lots of people are. Um, when it comes to kids' bedrooms, a lot of kids sleep with the lamp on. They need a kind of a light. By even switching the normal light bulb to even a red bulb or an orange bulb, that can help with um, production of melatonin levels because they don't emit this blue light. So, so simple little things like this, when you put them all together, it will make a huge difference. Um, again here, just going back to the smart devices, as I said, huge, huge problems. And it's not just the, not just the, the teenagers. I had a 70-year-old woman in the clinic one day, and when she was in the waiting room, she'd be on the iPad. And she was, I was asking her, you know, when you can't sleep, what kind of things do you do? She says, oh, I get up and I read the news. And I thought maybe she had a newspaper in the bed. And I said, look, you can't be reading in bed. She says, no, 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 I'm on the iPad. I look at all the news on the iPad. So that was banned from the room. And she came back in the following week. And I asked, I said, how did you get on? And she said, it has been the worst week of my life. She could not get over the effect that getting this smart, this smart device out of the room. She missed it really badly, but then she realised how it was having such an effect on her sleep. As I said, it's the light levels, but it's also the cognitive stimulation that goes with it. Um, going back again to a study from the United States that was done in 2014, it showed that 90% of adults and 75% of children reported at least one smart device in their bedroom. So that's either a phone, laptop, and remember a lot of the TVs now are smart TVs as well. So again, I said, get them out of the bedroom. Um, we all tend now to use our phones as the alarms. I do myself included. But that can be a twofold problem. Okay? If you wake up during the night, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to grab the phone, you're going to look at it, you're going to see the time. Once you see the time, the panic is going to set in. If it's 3 o'clock in the morning, you have to be up at 7 the panic is setting, oh my God, I'm not going to get back to sleep. I only have a couple of hours, what am I going to do? Then the other thing is, if you're not sleeping, you'll take the phone up and you might just start checking Facebook, Twitter. And again, that's, sleep is just not going to happen after that. So put the phone as far away from the bed as possible. Okay, And ideally, get it out of the room. Um, <clears throat> there's, um, as I said, I talked about these as well, about the, the melatonin levels. Um, this sentence kind of just kind of struck me as there's um, one of the kind of international experts in sleep is, is a fellow called Charles um, Scheisler. And really when he says anything, we kind of take note. And this is what he said about smart devices. He said, we introduce these devices that have medical and biological effects um, without requiring any health studies on their impact. They don't have to go through any evaluation like any other drug would for either safety or efficacy, and I think it's time to rethink that. As I said, we don't know the long-term effect that these smart devices are going to have, so as I said, they're brilliant. I mean, they're, we're in a world now we need to use them, but just not in the run-up to bed. So, moving on to temperature. And now we're starting to think that temp... We always knew the temperature played a role, but now we're thinking it might be an even bigger role than we actually thought. And we do know that cooler temperatures are much better in order for us to help to get us to sleep. <clears throat> I would see a lot of people, and it's not just the women, when they're having problems sleeping, they'll have the nice warm bath. They'll have the nice scent candles and they might even have the glass of wine in the bath. And then suddenly they'll hop into bed and wonder why they can't get to sleep. Okay? What they've done now is they've brought up their core body temperature. Okay? So sleep is not going to happen when we have that high, our core body temperature is increased. The, um, the other thing that we're doing is we're trying to save ourselves the 10 or 15 minutes in the morning. So we're actually having the shower just before we go to bed. 
And again, we're bringing up our core body temperature. And if you think about it, when you wake up in the morning, you're exhausted, and then you get into the shower. By the time you get out of the shower, you're wide awake. Okay? But people are doing this before bedtime, and they're not thinking about the consequences. Um, what we're doing now, the, the warm shower or the bath, it, it is good to help us to relax. And I actually am getting people to do it now, but they need to do it at least two hours before bed. And the reason for that is they are bringing up their core body temperature, but by bringing it up, it's going to have to go down. So you're nearly giving that whole physiologic process a bit of a kickstart. So ideally, as I said, have, by all means, have the nice bath with the smelly candles, maybe not the glass of wine, but do it two hours at least before bedtime. And it can actually help to start that whole physiological process. Okay. The busy mind. <clears throat> As I said previously, the busy mind is the most common trait of the insomniac, okay? You feel absolutely exhausted, but you can't get your mind to switch off, okay? And the overactive thinkers, as I said, are really, really very, very susceptible to, to insomnia. Um, the, the other thing to remember is that every thought you have gives way to an emotion, okay? And the way we think when we're lying in bed and can't sleep during the night is completely different to the way we would think when we're awake in, during the daytime. We never lie there thinking about, you know, can't sleep tonight, isn't life great, and I'm so happy with everything. That just doesn't happen. We always think about the worst case scenarios, and we're always probably thinking about things that could go wrong and probably are not going to go wrong at all, but that's just the way we're built. Um, so. I'd have people coming in and, you know, they'd say, oh, I was lying there and, you know, and I'm just lying there for hours at night. And I said, well, what kind of things do you be thinking about when you're lying in bed awake? And I said, oh, I don't think about anything. I was like, you can't. It's physically impossible. You have to be thinking about something. And if you're not thinking about something, the chances are you're probably asleep. So this busy mind, as I said, and there can be different thoughts associated with this busy mind, but all of them give rise to some kind of emotion, and that's usually a negative emotion. And when you have all these negative emotions going on, it's going to make sleep much, much harder to achieve. This is a diary that I had from a patient, and she's just textbook <coughs> insomnia, okay? Um, so I'll just read it there. It might be a little bit hard for you to see. It says, when 11 o'clock comes at night, I'm not tired mentally. Don't be yawning or dozing off, even though I'm exhausted. Okay, so she's exhausted, but she can't get the mind to switch off. Um, if I go into bed or couch during the day, again, she's developed these bad habits as well, that keeping the problem going. No sleep will come then either. And that's probably a good thing that she's not napping. Um, so she goes on then, and as I said, once people start to have problems with their sleep, they have all these really negative emotions associated with it, um, and it has a huge impact on their life, and then they start to plan around. Everything starts to go back. Well, when I make plans, well, I can't really, because they go back to thinking about how is that going to affect my sleep. Um, it says, uh, where are we? Um, again, very tired today. I have a poor quality of life as I can't really plan anything in advance um, and I never know when I'm going to get some sleep. Again, as I said, people start to associate everything back to this poor sleep. I had a girl in clinic last year and um, she was just after being away for a weekend with her boyfriend and he proposed and she was delighted. It was one of the happiest days of her life but she said the minute he proposed within a couple of minutes she was thinking oh no, when I get married now, the night before the wedding, I'm going to have to stay at home with my mum and dad and I'm not going to be able to sleep there. And then on the day of my wedding, I'm going to look horrific in the photos. That was, as I said, everything went back to this problem with sleep. So it impacts on your whole life so much. What should have been one of the happiest days of her life, she's now thinking back about her sleep. And when you have this negative association with sleep, it's not something that you're really going to enjoy doing. And you, you start to dread going to bed. Um, again, this going back to this lady, this here, um, this here is a little um, snapshot of a little monitoring device that I get patients to wear usually a week before they come in to see me. It's just looking at their sleep schedules because um, a lot of the time what somebody thinks is going on is not actually what's happening at all. And this is the case with this lady. Um, each day here, or each line here represents a day. So what we're looking at, this yellow 
is just light levels. The black is movement levels. And again, we're looking at from 12 noon to the following 12 noon. These blue bits here are the sleep periods. If you look here where there's no kind of movement levels, she's asleep, okay? This lady thought she was awake the whole night. But I'm going to just scoot down to here. Actually, I'll scoot to here. So we can see she actually goes off to sleep, but she does sleep. But then suddenly she's awake. What time is that? I can't see exactly what time. It's about maybe about 3 o'clock in the morning, for example. Say. Then she goes back to sleep again. And then she's awake at about maybe 5 o'clock in the morning. Then she gets another bit of sleep. And then she's awake again. And then she's another bit of sleep. So what she was doing, and this is going back to the whole thing about the clock or the phone. So if you wake up and you look at your phone and you look at the clock, 3 o'clock. Then you look at it again and it's 5 o'clock. And then you look at it again and it's 6 o'clock. You automatically think, well, I must have been awake from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock. But you're not. You're actually getting bits of sleep in there. And nearly, we all actually get more sleep than we think we do. But when it is fragmented and these little bits put together, we're just not feeling the effects of it. Okay? So as I said, this can also, or what we think is actually happening with her sleep may not be the case at all. I have people as well ringing me up in an absolute state of panic saying, I haven't slept in two months. I'm like, well, actually, you have slept in two months because it's physically impossible to go without sleeping for two months. So again, even when we have this problem, we're having sleepless nights, then I'm never going to get to sleep tonight. Well, again, that's going to make you pretty irritated, frustrated, the anxiety will kick in. But in fact, it's completely inaccurate what we're saying. We are nearly telling yourself you're not going to get to sleep, but we all do get some sleep. But even if you do go a whole night without sleep, it's not the end of the world. The body can cope with a certain amount of sleep deprivation. So trying to get this whole anxiety out of not being able to sleep is, is actually going to be a real, real help in, 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 in helping to, 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 to get, get rid of the problem. Um, stimulus control therapy is um, a technique that we use in the clinic. It's a really big part of the, the program, but it's the bit where people actually start to panic. The first week is usually easy enough. We ease them into it and then we, we hit them with this and it really does set the, the panic in. When you're having problems with sleep and you don't know what's ahead of you the night, that, whether it's going to be a bad night or a good night, you actually start to dread going to bed. And people actually put off going to bed. And I've even seen people that they've actually slept in a chair for years because the minute they put the foot in the bedroom, the panic set in. Um, and what we do, this is all about the whole connection then between bed and sleep gets broken down. Because people with insomnia, they tend to spend quite a long time in bed. They might be going off to bed at about 10 o'clock at night because they're trying to get to sleep. But it might be 12 or 1 o'clock by the time they get, actually get to sleep. So I said, well, what do you do in those couple of hours? I said, well, I read a book or I watch the telly. And, or they might be on the smart device. So what happens then, they're using this kind of periods of wakefulness. They're filling it up with reading the book or watching the telly or listening to the radio. And what happens then is this whole connection between sleep or bed and sleep gets broken down. So you're going into bed and your mind is thinking, OK, well, what am I here to do? Am I here to read my book or am I here to watch telly? Or am I here to just to toss and turn? Or am I here to think about the stuff that went on today or all the stuff I have to, got, I have to do and work tomorrow? So then the brain thinks, well, what am, I, what am I here? Am I here to sleep or what am I here to do? I kind of describe it to people as like, for people that drive a car, okay? If you sit into your driver's seat in a car, what do you expect to do? You expect to drive the car because that's what you're pre-programmed to do, okay? So we, it's basically this stimulus control therapy is applying the same principle to bed. You get into bed to sleep. And if you're not asleep, you shouldn't be in bed. So ideally, if you're in bed and you're still wide awake after roughly about 20 minutes or so, and you're still really quite alert and your mind is quite busy, the best thing you can do is get up and out of bed. Now, what you do when you get up and out of bed is, is just as important. So ideally, you should go to a nice living area, nice comfy seat, don't lie on a couch, maybe read your book there, listen to a bit of radio, don't have a clock in the space, try not to be thinking about the time. And you go there and you sit there until you're feeling sleepy. We all kind of have to get back to this sensation of feeling sleepy. Again, another question I get asked is, 
what's the best time to go to bed at? When should I go to bed? I said, there's no set bedtime. It's when you feel sleepy. You can't make yourself sleep, okay? It's, if we're hung- not hungry, we can still eat. If we're not thirsty, we can still drink. But if we're not sleepy, we can't make ourselves sleep and stay asleep. So this sensation of feeling sleepy, okay? Now, if you're feeling sleepy at six or seven o'clock in the, in the evening, that's not the time to go to bed. But in the run-up to bedtime, a certain time, don't be trying to catch up. Don't be going to bed at 10 o'clock because you know you have to be up for work at 7 in the morning. And a lot of people do that. Well, I think I should be going to bed. Or I go to bed when a certain program is over. I turn off the telly and that's my cue for going to bed. Or I go to bed because everybody else has gone to bed. Recognise feeling sleepy and only go to bed when feeling sleepy. Okay? Again, if you wake up during the night or you're still not asleep within the 15 minutes, up and out of the bed. The other thing then is no naps. That lady who's lying on the couch during the day, when you're not sleeping, you're trying to catch up on any little bits of sleep you can. Um, Ideally, no naps. The only exception to that is maybe if you have to drive um, or if you are driving and you feel sleepy, then a 15-minute nap is the most refreshing nap you can have. And if you really, really can't survive without a nap, it's always better to have it earlier on during the day um, than in the run-up to bed. So if you're napping in the chair, say at 8 o'clock at night in front of the telly, you're eating into that need for sleep. So then when you get into bed at night, the need for sleep is no longer going to be there. So try to avoid the nap in front of the telly. Earlier in the day is always best for a nap, but ideally do without. Because if you're getting enough of your sleep and the proper quality of sleep at night, you shouldn't need to nap. Because sometimes napping can be an indication that there is a problem with sleep. And then the the other thing that we do is sleep restriction therapy. This is when somebody's suffering from insomnia. As I said, they spend all of this amount of time in bed, but only this amount of time asleep. And what this little monitor does, and in conjunction with sleep diaries, we get an average sleep time that they have over the period of usually about a week. And what we do then is we get that average and we restrict them to that amount of time in bed. What we're trying to do is increase the need for sleep. We're actually purposely trying to make them really, really sleepy. Because the more sleepier you are, the more you're going to need sleep. Okay, So you're probably going to fall asleep quicker, but you'll also stay asleep because the need for sleep is there. Um, And that's what we call the sleep efficiency. Um, Ideally, we should have a sleep efficiency of about 90% which means we should be asleep for 90% of the time we're actually in bed. People with insomnia have really poor sleep efficiencies because they're doing all this other stuff in bed. Again, this is where use of a sleep diary comes in useful. Um, And even for people, if you think you have a problem with sleep, it's no harm to keep a diary for a week. Um, Because when you see it in black and white, it can maybe a couple of things that you're doing can actually jump out at you. Um, And this sleep restriction therapy, again, I said, it can really put the fear of God into people. But it's based on their results because the thing with insomnia is no two nights are the same. Every night is different. There might be one night they might be getting five hours sleep. There might be one night they're getting eight hours sleep. There might be one night they're getting three hours sleep. So what we're trying to do is get an average of that and try to re-regulate everything um, and get this whole circadian rhythm back to a normal pattern to set a good foundation to try to get them sleeping for 90% of the time but also to get pretty much every night the same and then we're only then we're in a position to find out exactly how much sleep they actually need because if you're having different amounts of sleep every night you have no way of knowing how much sleep do you need so then what we do is we start to add on little bits of sleep to find out how much they need to feel refreshed paradoxical intention is another one um people with insomnia they try really, really hard to sleep. And by the time they get to me, they've probably tried a load of other um, things that they might have tried relaxation exercises, they might be into other therapists, they may have done hypnotherapy. They could have done a range of things. But obviously none of them works. So that's why they end up with me. But if you ask a poor sleeper how did they sleep, they could give you all these things that they've tried and all the oils and lavenders and all of that. But if you ask a good sleeper how do you sleep, can't tell you because they don't try to do anything the more you think about sleeping and the more you try to sleep the less likely it's going to happen so a little tip if it's a thing you can't get to sleep what you're going to do is you're going to do the opposite you're going to actually try and stay awake 
So you lie in bed with the lights out, lie in a comfortable position and you just look straight ahead and you just imagine some kind of a simple image like a cross right ahead and you're going to keep your eyes completely focused on that cross and you're going to keep focused on keeping awake. And particularly we do this at the time that we do the sleep restriction and they will be very sleepy. So by putting all their efforts into staying awake, the opposite actually happens and they actually fall asleep. Okay? These are all skills that people do have to learn, so they do take time. It doesn't always happen the first or second time they try it, but this is, it, it reduces the performance anxiety. It stops that they're, they're trying really, really hard to sleep. Now they're actually trying really, really hard to stay awake. And just the last thing then is relaxation. <clears throat> As I said, prior to bed, this two hour before bedtime should be that you're basically going into a relaxation mode and you're, you're, you're um, preparing your body and your mind for sleep. So keep as relaxed as you can. Um, and usually when people get into bed, I give them um, a guided um, relaxation technique where they're actually listening to, to, to a technique. And the one that has been proven to help with insomnia is a thing called progressive muscle relaxation. Um, usually these techniques take about maybe 15 to 20 minutes. You can just even Google this and, and it'll bring it up. Um, I know even Beaumont Hospital have a website as well that, that you can download these from. Um, so basically it's just you're tensing and you're relaxing your muscles. And you'd go from the tips of your fingers, top of your head, down to the bottom of your toes. So it's making sure that the body is relax, as relaxed as possible. And again, helping to keep those cortisol levels down. The other thing as well is that if you're listening to some kind of a guided um, technique, you're so focused on listening to that that you're not really thinking about trying to get to sleep. Um, and again, if use whatever technique. Some people, you know, if you don't like the voice of the person that's saying it, don't go with it. So get something that you like. Keep, keep to make sure that's no more than 20 minutes long because things like radio, for example, people say, oh, radio gets me off to sleep. It's like, yeah, great, it'll get you off to sleep. But it's like if someone's talking into your ear constantly, it's going to end up waking you up again. So have something, if it's a piece of music, have it for about 20 minutes long. And because you know then by the end of that, if you're still wide awake, that is your cue to get up and out of bed. Okay? So it's really important to keep the body as relaxed as possible, but also the mind. So you do have to prepare your body for sleep. Okay? Um, that's it. Any questions? <laughs>